I think one of the first questions we're going to be asking is um, you know, whether threat intelligence is actually necessary or attribution is necessary. Uh, you know, does it make any difference if we know who's attacking us? $10 billion, by far the biggest cyber attack in history. Within 15 minutes, the, the entire environment was taken down. The thing that really amazed me were how many corollaries were being drawn from the military. I've worked very, very closely with CISOs over the last two, three years, and the challenges they face are uh, amazing. We kind of just touched the surface. There is so much more to this conversation. So on attribution, um, why do we need to know if it's a nation state, if it's a cyber criminal gang, or, or if it's an activist attacking you, or do we need to know? Does it make any difference? For starters, from an attribution perspective, the only companies I've ever worked with where attribution has been important is where there has been a legal implication or a law enforcement implication. And so what we've done then is to bring in the necessary entities in order to make sure that whatever case was being put together um, was presentable um, in a court of law or again back to the law enforcement authorities. Um, any other, uh, I guess, mechanism for attribution above and beyond that is not something that I've traditionally found to be critical in a lot of companies I've worked for because it's been more an idea or a mindset of, you know, we need to protect what's here. As long as this is protected, then we move on to the next problem. We move on to the next attack. And I think a lot of that is driven from the fact that so many attacks nowadays are, are sprayed, you know, so they're sort of either mass scan, mass um, credential brute forcing, you know, whatever it might be, you're not going to most likely find an actor for that. You're not going to be able to attribute that stuff. And if you did, um, there's no guarantee that it wouldn't just pop up somewhere else. For example, uh, Magecart, right? Magecart, I think, would be really fantastic to be able to attribute the types of things that um, that attacker group would go after. Being able to look at that and specify, are we potentially exposed to a Magecart style attacker um, or threat actor I think is important from that type of attribution but then not being able to necessarily say you know it was specific mage card actor you know Joe Bloggs or whomever. Threat intelligence is a combination of both technology and people. It can come in various different shapes and sizes depending on the type of organization that you have. The question is what's appropriate for you? It's all about contextualization. It's putting the context around what's important to you what you deem to be your threat landscape and how you're going to manage those risks and threats accordingly. I've been both a supplier for many years and now I'm a supplier but I'm also a consumer so I've got my own tech company now and in, within our tech company we have to identify what are the problems that affect my business today and then what are the requirements I need to uh, help mitigate some of those risks for my company and how do I do it? Well I can do it because I'm I've got a whole bunch of buddies in within the security industry um, and I can just pick up the phone and instantly we can get a view on things. However, if you're not in the security industry, like Lionship of the country isn't and Lionship, Lionship enterprises aren't in, in globally, it's very, very difficult for these organizations to first off understand they've got a business challenge that's come in, but then to understand how do we uh, go out and look for a solution for that business requirement. And it's, it is difficult. A good threat intelligence program um, obviously is exceptionally useful uh, as part of a, an overall cyber risk reduction. But equally, you have to remember it's an intelligence program. So uh, if you're just in consuming data feeds and you're not linking that back to an asset database, it can actually spiral with cost. Intelligence is, from anyone, it can be valuable. If I was going to be talking to a, to a customer or an organization about introducing threat intelligence, I would say don't just get in threat, threat intelligence from us. Get it from us, but get some open source in threat intelligence. Get it from a US-based vendor. Get it from a Chinese vendor. Get a global feel. So for instance, the, the, the big providers, the next generation, Seam Engines and SOC, they already have intelligence built into them. I think I spend 10 pound a user per month for a full end-to-end -end suite of the, the signals that I need to monitor my users and also the end-to-end -end, uh, SOC capability. 
That would have cost 50, 60 pound a user per month in a, in a large multinational. And the price is coming down dramatically. The capabilities around automation and using the next generation of capabilities is, is, is groundbreaking. It's going to revolutionize the security industry in the next few years. One of the things that's been interesting um, to me, again, being in the CISO role over the past year and a half now, is looking at gaps in a whole new light. You know, my past um, security lives, I've been responsible for certain areas of security. And obviously now in the CISO role, it's having sort of that full understanding and comprehension and then being able to bring the whole puzzle pieces, you know, all the puzzle pieces together to have um, a, an overall understanding of what's going on. Having the conversation in the public domain not only helps educate, um, it raises awareness, it can help us train, you know, the next generation of cybersecurity professionals uh, better. Uh, but we can learn from each other. I think fundamentally, we're just at the beginning of this conversation. It, it, it's going to continue.